Howdy. In this video, let's go over an example dealing with the equilibrium of a rigid body in three dimensions. Our job for today is going to be to figure out what's going on at the ball and socket support A, at the journal bearing B, as well as to figure out the force P that is being applied here on this windlass so that this body is in equilibrium. Again, in this problem, equilibrium means it's not rotating up or down, just enough force to keep it there uh, without rotating. So since this problem is in three dimensions, remember we're going to have up to six equations of equilibrium. If the sum of the forces in the x, y, and z directions are zero, it means our body is not going to try to translate anywhere along the x, y, or z directions. If we sum moments about x, y, and z axes, now we also ensure that the body is not rotating, right? It's perfectly still. Now the easy thing to do with this 3D problems is going to be just to sum forces in the x, y, and z direction first. For the sake of space here, and I might need this one, I'm just going to go ahead and convert this drawing into a free body diagram. So what would be the steps, right, to do a free body diagram? The first thing that you want to do is identify the body that you want to draw the free body diagram for. So in, in this problem, we want to figure out what's going on at ball and socket A, journal bearing B, this force P. I hope that you can see that all these forces or reactions are touching or intersecting this guy over here. The free body diagram is going to be for the hand crank. So let's start with the first one, the first one at point A. We have a ball and socket. Do you remember what the reaction forces look like for a ball and socket? Hopefully you remember that a ball and socket is just like our shoulder joint, right? So if I were to assign the X, Y, and Z directions to my joint, maybe let's do it like this. I'm gonna follow this. So let's say our X axis is pointing towards the camera. My ball and socket allows my arm to rotate about the X axis. If the Y axis now is pointing forward, I can still point my arm now in that direction and I can still kind of rotate about the Y axis. The Z axis would be pointing up. Let me try on this way so you don't see nasty stuff. That's the y Z axis and I can rotate my arm in the Z direction, right? It doesn't allow, at least my arm, I mean, I'm a little bit older, it doesn't allow a lot of rotation, but it doesn't resist. I mean, it should be allowing the rotations. However, I cannot grab my arm and it's a good thing, right? And I can't pull it out on the X direction. Somebody can't jank it and pull it out on the Y or the Z. If you pull hard enough, yes, right? But there's gonna be some resistance, right? That's what we're trying to get to, the re resistance or the reaction forces. So a ball and socket is gonna see only reaction forces, no reaction moments. So let me go ahead and re erase this ball and socket so that I have just in blue this hand crank over here. I'm gonna put the reaction forces. So there's gonna be one in the X direction. I'm gonna assume positive. There's gonna be one in the Y direction. So I'm gonna assume here positive in the Y and one in the Z direction. Pointing in the positive Z. Now I got ahead of myself because I'm trying to solve for the ball and socket at A and the journal bearings of B. I started drawing the reactions at A, but if you remember the process I usually teach is we draw the outline of the free body diagram or the outline of the body. We put the applied forces, then the reactions. So I forgot to mention here that this hand crank, the only applied force that the crank is seeing comes from this mass over here that is exerting 150 pounds. Now, in this unit system, 150 pounds, it's already a force, so we can replace this mass over here by just a downward arrow, right? And it's 150 pounds. So we have the outline, more or less is not done correctly. We have the applied force, that's the first reaction forces at point A. The body is also being supported at this point B. Remember we have a journal bearing, and there's really two types of bearings you wanna worry about in statics. There's the journal bearing and the thrust bearing. Remember the thrust bearing, like thrust on an airplane is a sideways force to try to move it forward. 
when we're talking about bearing so thrust bearing is going to keep the shaft from like pulling out or sliding through this is a journal bearing so it's not going to have that capacity so we don't have to worry about forces here in the y direction but if i have this bearing at b which is helping or permitting the shaft to rotate it's not going to promote uh again prevent relative motion about the y-axis because it's not a thrust bearing it's just a journal bearing but what i can do is i can grab this crank and move it sided along the x direction i also can just move it and pick it up along the z the this bearing here is attached it's going to keep it anchored so i'm going to need to replace this journal bearing right with those reaction forces so let me complete the hand crank and we say no, I cannot grab it and slide it about the X. So I'm going to put here a BX force. And no, I can't pick it up and move it about the Z axis. So I'm going to put a BZ force. I'm not going to think too much about what direction they're going to point. I'm just going to point in the positive X and the positive Z direction. Now, if you remember, whenever you have a journal bearing or even a thrust bearing, let me draw one. Here, and the shaft is going through there. We talked about the possibility that yes, I cannot just jank or pull the, the shaft up, I can slide it here about the x axis. So, let's put here x. In this case, Z axis. So I need reaction forces there, just like I have over here. But the only, the other thing that can happen is if I have this bearing, we say if I put a sideways force on this shaft, trying to make it rotate because there's a weight associated with this bearing, it can try to prevent rotation. So there is a possibility for this bearing to exert a reaction here, a moment about the Z. As well as, if we look at it now about the x-axis, I cannot rotate it up and down like that. As well as a moment here about the x-axis. Now we said for bearings in particular, these moment reactions are only going to come about if there is nothing else on this shaft that will prevent that rotation. What do I mean? So if all I have is a shaft and I put a sideways load, right it's going to try to rotate the bearing has a capacity to to resist that rotation with the moment however if there's something else on the shaft that can prevent the rotation then the bearing does not develop this reaction moment what do i mean so we look at b over here right there's a bearing and if there's a sideways force just like this one here to push it on it right it's gonna want to make the shaft to rotate about this bearing however at this other end it has a ball and socket and it's resisting right it has capacity to resist so for the reason if i push over here because i have another force at the other end bringing it back in equilibrium the bearing doesn't need to develop that twisting moment so in this case there is no moment about the x no moment about the z z and x again because even if if I go up and down, if I try to push on it, this other end of the shaft has to translate up. But there's always, there's already something here preventing that translation here in the Z. Again, we don't need a moment about the X or the Z because the shaft is being supported at point A with the ball and socket. All of these reaction forces were assumed to be positive. The only other place where, where this crank um interacts with the outside world is over here where there's this hand and it's pulling on it with a force p and our job is going to be to figure out what this force p is right so i can remove this hand over here i can forget that there's a hand there Com complete my free body diagram now that's the complete outline and then just put that force from the hand touching that crank over there so now this looks more like a proper free body diagram where I have the outline, I have applied force, and then I have reaction forces over here. I have the distances, 
and I have the X, Y, and Z coordinate system already drawn in here. So now we can go and move to the next step, which is going to be to perform the actual analysis. Now let's look at how many unknowns we have in this problem. I have one, two, three, four, five, six unknowns. And we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six equations of equilibrium. So that means that for, in order for us to solve this problem, we're going to need to apply all six equations of equilibrium. We need a sum forces in the X, Y, and Z directions, and we're going to need three other moment equations. So these are the equations that we have available. Usually I like to advise my students to start with the moments. It's a little bit harder, but once we get through that hurdle, the sum of the forces is going to be super easy. So let's look at the free body diagram. Before we started summing moments and even forces here, we want to make sure that we don't have any forces at an angle, that we already have the X, Y, and Z components of all the forces. If you happen to have a force at an angle or going through two points, you would want to write those forces in Cartesian vectors so that you would have the X, Y, and Z components of those forces. It's going to simplify our lives when it, when it gets time to some moments about axes and some forces in the X, Y, and Z directions. So because that's been taken care of for us, we're going to go ahead and start summing moments. Now the first question, whenever you hear the term, let's sum moments, for you it should be about which point do I sum the moments, right? Because forces, we can sum them, they're independent of the point that we pick, but moments are going to be dependent. So can you spot a good point to sum moments in this problem? If you pick point A, that's a good guess. Why? Because I have AX, AY, and Z. I have three unknowns that pass through that point. So if I sum moments about point A, they are not going to contribute, right? We're only going to see BX, BZ, and possibly P show up in those equations. So always you want to sum moments where you have the most number of unknowns. Point A is a good one. The next point could be point B. I have only two there, but it's also a good point. So let's start with summing moments um, at point A about the x-axis. So the sum of the moments about the x-axis, we're going to make it equal to zero. Again, this is going to be at point A. So what does this mean? Some of the moments about the x-axis. So we have this crank over here. The x-axis is pointing this way. And we're going to look for moments that are going to create a tendency to rotate about the x-axis. So something like this over here. Again, because we're summing moments at point A, none of these are going to contribute. So I need to start moving away from it. So as I start moving away, the first force that I encounter is this one that's 150. And so the question becomes, if I have something pointing down with 150, will it cross a rotation about the X? And the answer, it is. So the force is 150. The distance, specifically the perpendicular distance between the force and our axis of interest is two feet. Right, so we have the force, the distance. Next is what is gonna be the sign? So to figure that one out, we're going to use the right hand rule. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my fist here at point A. Then I'm going to point my fingers in the direction of the force. So in this case, I will need to point that way. And then once I go and intersect the force, I'm going to curl these fingers in the direction of the force. So the force is pointing down. So now I now need to go down. And if you can see this rotation here, you can you see where the thumb is pointing? right? It's pointing towards the negative x-axis, right? If the rotation was like that, it would be pointing towards a positive x. Again, this force is going to, if we're pivoting about point A, right? Whenever we're doing this, by the way, we forget about any other supports on, on this body. So we just think of this body being pin connected at x. If I push down, it's going to make it rotate like that. Right, if this was a 2D problem, that would be a clockwise moment because it's 3D. Really, we have to use the right hand. The rotation is like that. The thumb is to pointing towards the x axis. Negative, sorry. So that becomes a negative moment. Okay, so as we move away, we get to point B. Now there's two 
forces or two components of the force V here, the X component and the Z component. So the question is, well, the X component of a force cause a rotation about the X axis. So that is, if I push like this, would I ever cause the body to rotate this way by pushing along the X? And the answer is no. A force in the X will never cause a rotation in the X, right? A force on the Y will never cause a rotation in the Y, or a force in the Z will never cause a rotation about the Z. So here BX does not contribute, but we have BZ. BZ is pointing up. So if you can imagine this force pushing up, this is going to make it rotate like so. That's going to be a positive moment. Again, my thumb is pointing toward the positive x-axis. So it's going to be a positive. The force is BZ. And the distance from the force to our x-axis, the perpendicular distance is going to be 4. So again, this is a positive moment here because I assume BZ to point up. This might not be the case, so let's figure it out and, and solve the equations of equilibrium. Um, so that's yet to be verified, but how I drew it in this free body diagram, it's up, so that creates a positive moment. So we're done here at point B, and if we continue sweeping, we got a force P. But P is in the direction of the X, it's a horizontal force as well. So this guy will never cause a, a rotation about the X. It wants to translate the body along the X axis. So that's it. So the sum of the moments, in this case we only have two, must be equal to zero. I hope that you can see here that we can solve for BZ rather quickly, right? Let's go ahead and do it. So BZ in this problem is going to be equal to, I'm going to move this to the other side. So I'm going to have 150 times 2 and then this divided by 4. So this is basically one half of 150, or that BZ equals 75 pounds. Notice the number is positive. So a positive number for the reaction force means that the direction that I assume was correct. So I go back to my free body diagram and I look at it and say, like, oh, it was pointing up. That was my assumption. I got a positive number means there was a correct assumption for the sense. Of that force so I can put a little arrow pointing up and that's going to be our BZ 75 pointing up so I want to remind you that we summed the moments at point A if we're following the notation from the Hibbler book we would put here parentheses and put there a little a so it's signifying it's the sum of the moments about the x-axis at point A so let's do the next one now we're going to sum the moments about the y-axis at point A, again, that has to be equal to zero. So when we look at this problem, right, we're looking at point A, that's our point of interest, and we're looking for moments about the y-axis, or things that are going to make our crank over here rotate about the y-axis. Because we're at the y-axis and we're doing specifically the moments at point A, none of these guys are going to show up. Their moment arm is zero, they pass through point A. So as we sweep away, the first force that we encounter is 150 applied force. And the question is, do you think that 150 force is going to cause a rotation about the y-axis? And here you can get kind of tricky just because the way the drawing that I drew over here is not as clear. So this axis over here, the y-axis is passing through the center, right, of this crank. But this force over here, which was from that weight that was hanging, it's on this drum, right? So this drum is separated some distance. So there's some distance to this drum over here from where the force is kind of passing down. So that distance is going to be the radius of this drum. So that radius is 0 0.5. Okay, and I have 150 pound force. So it's not, again, going through the axis. It's separated this way. So I have something off some distance that is pushing down is going to do this kind of rotation, right? So this 150 pound force is going to cause a positive rotation about the Y because see my thumb is pointing towards a positive Y. Again, from the picture, I don't know if you can see it clearly, this rope over here is forward or in front of the drum over here. It's falling towards the front. 
Anyway, so we have the force, which is 150 pounds. The perpendicular distance to the y-axis, remember we're summing moment about the y-axis, is 0 0.5. And that created a positive moment. Next, we continue sweeping and we got the forces at B. These two forces are going to intersect the y-axis. So they are incapable of generating a moment about the y-axis. So these are not going to show up. Next, I have this crank over here. See how it separated some distance here along the z-axis? So when I pull on this crank this way, right, I'm going to bring it back. Notice as I pull, the rotation of the hand is this way. So it's going to create a moment where that moment is, see my thumb pointing toward the negative y. So this is minus. The force is going to be p, what we're trying to figure out. The distance or perpendicular distance to the y-axis is going to be the distance here in the z, or 1. Let me check again real quick. These pass through the y-axis. We got this one. These paths do not show moment in this one. So only these two can generate a moment about the y-axis, and the sum of those moments must be equal to 0. So I hope you can see from this one, right, I can move the p to the other side. It becomes positive. So I move the P to the other side becomes positive. And on this side, I have 150 times 0.5, or half of 150, which would make it 75, right? So 75 pounds. Again, this is a positive number. When I move the P to the other side, becomes positive. So that means 75 is a positive answer, which means the direction over here is correct. So it's actually being pulled like we... We had drawn it, drawn it over here. So that's the magnitude of the force P that we need for this guy to remain in equilibrium. Let's go ahead and do the last one. There's some moments now about the z-axis. Again, all of this at point A, we need to make sure that equals to zero. What is the z-axis? Well, the z-axis is pointing up. So we're looking for things that are going to make the shaft kind of swing in these type of rotations, so about the z-axis. If it makes it rotate that way, see my thumb like that? If it makes the shaft kind of push into the board, that's going to be a positive moment. Again, my right hand and the thumb is pointing up. If there's something pushing the shaft, I mean, sorry, this crank over here towards me or in this direction, that's going to be a negative moment because that rotation puts that thumb in the negative z. Alrighty, so you know the drill, AX, a Y and A Z do not create a moment because they're at the point A, the point that we're summing moments. Cool. Right? We have 150 pound force. This is in the Z direction. Again, so if I have my crank and I have something pushing down, it's going to do two things. It's going to try to translate it down. And you can see here, if I push down, it tries to make it rotate about the X. But if I push down, I will never make it rotate here about the Z. So again, a force in the Z does not create a rotation about the Z. This guy doesn't show up. BZ is not going to show up. But BX over here, look at it. It's pushing this way. Again, this is the direction that I assume. If I push it that way, it causes that type of sweep or rotation. That's going to be a negative moment. Oops, I lost the marker. So it's a negative moment. So it's the minus the force, which is BX times the distance. Specifically, the perpendicular distance between the force BX and our Z-axis, which is 4. 4 feet. So we're done here. As we continue sweeping, we have another horizontal force. P, again, is pulling this way. It's going to make it rotate in the negative Z direction. So minus, minus P. And the perpendicular distance to P, right, is 2, plus 2 is 4, plus 1 is 5. And then we drop down, plus 1 more is 6. So this is P by 6. Those are the only thing that can cause a rotation about the z-axis. The sum of those two must be equal to 0. Notice we know what P is already, right? So this is, this is already a given. So we can solve for Bx rather rather quickly so what would i do we see b x over here is going to be equal to move the p to the other side here was negative is going to become positive p 
times 6 and then divide it by a negative 4. Remember P is 75, so it's going to be 75 times 6 divided by a negative 4. It's 75 times 6 divided by 4. It's 112.5, and it's going to be negative. 112.5, and this is a negative number. What does negative number mean? 112.5 pounds. Negative means that the direction that I assume over here is incorrecto, right? So I had assumed Vx to be in the positive x really points in the negative x direction. So Vx points in the negative x direction. So Vx is negative. So because this is a 3D problem, I kind of messed up over here on this one when I say Bz, it's pointing up, really it's a positive number. Vx over here, now we know it's going to be a negative component. Actually, we can write it like this, or sometimes you might want to write it in Cartesian vector notation. So again, the x is associated with the uh, i hat. So this is minus 112.5 i hat, and the units would be pounds. That's another way to write it. Either of those two things mean the same thing. Vx is not this way, it's not a point that way. So we're done with the sum of the moments equations. The next ones we have is the sum of the forces. So let's go ahead and do that. Some forces. Let's sum forces in the x direction, make it equal to zero. So again, when we're summing forces, super easy. We just look at our free body diagram and the direction that these arrows are pointing. So ax is pointing toward the positive x, so plus ax. bx is pointing toward the positive x axis, so plus bx. And P is also pointing towards the positive X axis, so plus P. The sum of these three must be equal to zero. And I know what you're thinking is, hey, Professor, we saw for BX and it was negative. How come you wrote it positive? Well, again, because you want to get into the habit. When you're writing the equations of equilibrium, you're just looking at the direction that the arrows are pointing on the free body diagram. If we later solve for a reaction, in this case, BX or P, and we figure out that there are negative numbers, we're just gonna put a negative number here. So look what will happen. We wanna, we know we have Vx and the value of Vp. So Ax, to solve for it, I'm gonna move this to the other side. So we're gonna have minus Vx minus P. Well, as we substitute the values, minus, and remember Vx was negative, so we're gonna put minus a negative 112.5 minus the value of p, which is 75. So really we have minus a negative, which means it's positive, 112.5 minus 75. So this tells us that Ax is going to be positive 37.5 pounds. This is our Ax. Again, it's positive. I'm going to put a little plus there. Next, let's do some of the forces in the y direction. So some of the forces in the y equal to zero. I start over here with the first one. I have ay pointing in the positive y direction. And then this is in the z, x and z, and then this is in the x. So there's nothing else. So this tells me that ay, right, the sum of the forces must be equal to zero. I only got one, so that guy must be equal to zero. So there's no ay. The last one is going to be the sum of the forces in the z direction. Make it equal to zero. So I have az pointing up. So positive az. AC there. Next I have 150. It's pointing down. So minus 150. And then I have bz. So plus bz. And this is horizontal, so that's it, right? We look at this equation, we already figured out Bz value. Where is it? Over here, right? So I can solve for Az. It's going to be equal to, move this to the other side, so it's going to become positive 150 minus Bz. Now Bz was a positive value, so minus 75. So 150 minus 75 is going to be just 75 pounds. That's the value for AZ.
There you go. We saw for all the support reaction forces at the bond socket and A at the bearing B in the value of P. But before we call it quits, let's check our answers and let's do a sanity check to see if it makes any sense. So let's start with a P over here, this force P that we were trying to figure out. Let's look at the values that we got. They're telling us, or I'm actually, I'm telling you that the value of P should be 75 pounds. Does that make any sense? Well, let's look at the problem, right? We have this crank over here is supported at the ball and socket that's going to allow rotations and a bearing that's going to allow rotation. We have 150 pound force, right? At a distance of a half a foot that is trying to make it rotate like so, like it wants to unwrap itself. It's 150. But then we're putting a force B, restoring force, and so we're pulling back this way to bring it back up with, we're saying 75 pounds P over here. Does it make sense? I hope you can see that it makes some sense. I get 150 at half a distance. So if we're at double, because now our distance is one foot, then we're going to need half the force. So it makes a lot of sense that P is half of the force that is trying to rotate this crank like so. Let's look at what uh, maybe the, the forces here at the B. So for BX, we say that we have a negative um, number over here. So it's saying that instead of kind of pushing that way, it pulls in that direction to keep it in equilibrium. I hope you can see that at least a direction like that makes some sense. Why do I say that? Well, here's our crank. And remember at this end, we're pulling this way, right? So if there's nothing bringing it back, it would just rotate like that, like crazy, right? But no, that's what that's one of the functions bearing B is doing. As we're pulling on this P over here to bring it this way, Vx, remember, was negative, means we're gonna push back on it, like so. To bring it back in equilibrium to keep it from rotating. So that makes that makes some sense that this guy is negative. Um the number, it gets a little bit tricky. This is 75 pounds, the P. So at this very big end, I'm putting 75 pounds. So if I need to kind of balance it with another force to bring it back, it makes some sense that this one that is at a shorter distance is going to be higher. And even let's take a look at this, right? So if I have the crank with the P at the end, I pull this way. And then at the B, right? The, the P is pushing this way. The V is pushing back to bring it in equilibrium. But because the two are not in the same point, see what happens if I push forward with P and back with the V. There's a tendency for this crank to kind of want to rotate that way. So it makes a lot of sense now that AZ, I'm sorry, AX at this other end brings it back. Because again, P goes forward, B goes back. We would have that rotating except AX brings it back into equilibrium. Next is the directions in the Z direction, right? So this is 150 pounds over here. And look at the value for a, a Z. It's 75 pounds going up. And BZ over here is 75 pounds. So if we just isolate this problem and we think of it as a 2D, right? Something like this, we have A and B. Look at where the 150 force is. It's right at the middle or two feet from the two ends. So does it make a lot of sense that if I'm pulling down with 150, both A and B need to push up equally with 75 pounds? See, AZ and BZ. It makes a lot of sense that the two have to carry the weight of the 150. The next one is AY. Remember AY over here was equal to zero. What does that mean? It means that there's nothing here in the in the y direction. It makes perfect sense. The only applied force is down, and then we're kind of pulling this way to bring it back up, but there's nothing actively trying to move this along the y. So that's why right now the reaction force is zero, means we really don't need something here pushing or pulling in the y because there's no applied forces on the y I'm sorry, in the y direction. So there you go. I think we looked at P, B, X, B, Z, and all the other ones. Uh, hopefully you were able to follow along and try to make some sense of what these numbers mean. 
always always recommend that you do kind of that sanity check just to make sure that it makes some some sense so i hope you found this video useful as always if you find any mistakes on the video do let everybody know in the comments below um otherwise um we'll see you on the next one